You guys heard from one of our uh, illustrious senior professors here at the Salk Institute with Ron's talk. He's been here at the Salk Institute for 36 years now? 38, is that it? <laughs> okay. And then, of course, we had Riven, who um, has been with us for 11 years now. Um, our next speaker is one of our newest people here at the Salk Institute. So Patrick um, comes to us through our Salk Fellows Program, which is, a, he's a Helmley, Helmsley? Yeah, Salk, Salk Fellow. It's a Helmsley Salk Fellow. So this is one of the people that has been brought in as one of our rising young stars. And you'll, Ruben already told you a little bit about why he was brought in here to the Salk Institute. And again, you have his biography here. Yeah, I like the fact that he made Forbes coveted 30 under 30 lists okay, for his genome en engineering. So he's about to make all of us feel really, really old, but <laughs> with his fabulous research. So please welcome Patrick. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Is this on? Hello. Cool. Thank you, Don, for the introduction. And thanks for uh, staying for the really the last talk here. I hope you can stay awake for me today. So. <laughs> So good morning. I'd like to tell you a bit about some of the work that we're doing in my group and also, you know, really broadly in the research field over the last few years. And so we've known for quite a long time now that genes encode for the basic building blocks of cell function, but also more broadly life and having tools for allowing the rapid and precise ma manipulation of such genetic information would really be broadly useful for a variety of fields, such as in basic biology research. For example, you might want to take ion channels that allow the brain to organize and talk to itself and see how they're dysregulated in disease if you delete them in cell models. Or you might understand how they allow the brain to develop and fire and wire properly, or how they can lead to schizophrenia or autism. The potential for translational applications is also very exciting. So if genetic mutations can lead to genetic disease. Imagine being able to go into the cells of your own body and correct that mutation with healthy DNA sequence. This would be a really intellectually attractive method of doing gene therapies, because instead of taking a prescription drug that simply treats the symptoms of your disorder, you might be able to go in and correct the root underlying cause. Finally, being able to change cells by modifying or changing or putting in new DNA we would be able to start to have interesting biotechnological applications. For example, the refactoring or modification of simpler life forms for useful tasks. We might be able to make uh, genetically engineered plants for improved agriculture, biofactories for the production of biofuels or useful industrial uh, precursors. But the ability to really do all of these things to precisely engineer biological systems at some level relies on the ability to manipulate DNA inside of cells and not in a test tube. So really, the beginnings to realize this vision really began in the early 70s, back when Prince Charles met Princess Dee. And one of the, the key players here was this, this guy named Herb Boyer, then at UCSF working with Stanley Cohen at Stanford. And what they reported in 1973 was really the construction of functional organisms that were able to combine and replicate information from different organisms. And they were using restriction enzymes that were able to so-called cut and paste DNA and, 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 and then basically use this to construct organisms with new function that they normally wouldn't have. However, restriction enzymes, these molecular scissors, recognize a six base pair sequence. That's a specific sequence in the genome. How could we have these molecular scissors, so to speak, that would be able to recognize pretty much any sequence so that we could target any gene? So around the same time, there was a growing realization that DNA damage can stimulate DNA repair. This was first discovered around the same time in Miroslav Rodman's lab, partly on the basis of UV irradiation mutagenesis experiments. So that's also known as something that happens to you when you lie on black speech, right? The, you know, the hot sun tans, uh, you're, you're, and, and basically it also breaks your DNA. Right? And so your cell will summon a host of repair factors just to try to stitch this DNA back together. 
Now, this can happen in a non-specific way because UV irradiation happens kind of randomly. The DNA damage is spread throughout the DNA in your cells, but this can also happen in a much more specific way. So Jim Haber then at Brandeis found that if you introduced homing endonuclease sites, so very specific recognition sites, much like the six-base recognition site of the restriction enzyme, into specific places of the yeast genome, targeted breaks would lead to also targeted repair only at the broken DNA ends. So, in the mid-90s, Srinivasan and Transsegrin, and then at Hopkins, sort of took these two observations together and fused nuclease domains, molecular scissors domains, to zinc finger proteins. These are DNA binding domains found naturally inside of mammalian cells and found that we could actually create targeted DNA breaks that way. So this idea of targeted DNA breaks is really the major underlying concept for modern genome editing technologies, and it really relies on the ability to hijack the endogenous DNA repair machinery inside of the cell. So if we take some stretch of DNA shown here in blue, and it's broken, the cell will go through an SOS response where it tries to stitch its DNA back together. Otherwise, it'll rapidly accumulate mutations and eventually die. So when this DNA is broken, it goes through one of two major repair pathways, although the real story of DNA repair has really been evolving over the last 30, 40 years and is actually much more complicated than this. But if we sort of broadly simplify it, one repair pathway is known as non-homologous end joining. That's quite a mouthful. But what happens is the cell will take certain proteins that will try to stitch the DNA back together. Usually it does so perfectly, but it also can do so in an error-prone way. That can lead to the introduction of short insertions or deletions at the break site, or what we call indel mutations. What happens when this happens in the right place in a gene is that it can scramble the protein, or it can lead to a frame shift that will lead to a premature stop codon that will basically tell the protein translation machinery of this cell to stop. Then you get a truncation of that protein and what we call gene knockout or loss of function. You can knock out the function of that gene and turn it off, okay? So that's one possibility, NHEJ. The other possibility is actually much more powerful, and it's known as homology-directed repair. And it takes advantage of a very special thing inside of our cells that for every gene, we have two copies, okay? So if you break one copy, the cell will look for the other copy as a perfect template for repair. Now, this can be, this observation can sort of be again hijacked by us as bioengineers so that we can introduce so-called repair templates. So this is the broken DNA end shown here in dark blue, and the light blue would normally be that sister gene. We can introduce here in bold some DNA that we want to actually introduce, okay? This, this is what we call a transgene. And we can essentially trick the cell to recombine in this repair template. So instead of looking to the sister copy of that gene for repair, it recombines in the specific repair template that I've put into these cells. And that can allow us to make very precise changes in the genome. Instead of error-prone knockout, we can introduce mutations, we can correct mutations, we can even start to put in larger sequences in the cell to modify it in much larger ways. So how can we create these kinds of double-strand breaks to make these two different kinds of repair, right? So these nucleus domains, <clears throat> excuse me, that allow you to cut DNA have really been known for quite a while. The real challenge was to be able to get easily targeted and easily retargeted DNA binding. And that actually was much harder. But if we were able to be able to do that, we would be able to turn virtually any organism into a genetically tractable model like E. coli or yeast that we use in the lab. How can we do this for human cells, but, you know, any cell that works with DNA? So the first solution zinc fingers I've already told you about was to look at DNA binding uh, proteins found inside of mammalian cells. And so these zinc finger uh, motifs are essentially, you can think of them like Lego blocks. Each one of them recognizes three DNA bases at a time, and you can string different combinations of them together, like beads on a string, to recognize ever longer stretches of DNA. However, the number of combinations that you would need to recognize any sequence inside a three billion base pair human genome is actually very high, right? So we started to look at what other organisms try to solve this challenge. So in 2009, there are actually these plant pathogens that are found in actually rice that allow you to find these DNA binding domains that recognize only one base of DNA at a time. So we only have four bases in our genome, A, C, T, and G. So you would only need four different domains. So this would be dramatically simpler than the zinc finger system. These tails, 
you would have a purely modular system where you would just take this one that recognizes A, this one that recognizes C, this is T, G, G, and whatever sequence in the genome that you might want to target, you would just sort of mix and match them and snap them together like Lego blocks. So that all sounds well and good. You could take these proteins, fuse them to molecular scissors, and break any part of the genome that you like. So we could do this back in you know, the late 90s and then with tails in the early 2000s. So what changed? Why CRISPR, right? It turns out actually creating these Lego blocks is actually really, really difficult. It's a real protein engineering challenge to do in the lab. It's slow, it's expensive, it's hard to use, it also like uh, breaks all the time. So it actually is like another uh, thing that many of you may have used, right? So we began to try to look for a simpler method, right? And one of those solutions actually came again from bacteria, but like from uh, systems that we call CRISPR. So this is really the star player in the ancient warfare between bacteria and their forms of viruses called bacteriophage. And what happens in the early steps of this infection is that a bacteriophage will attempt to insert its DNA into the bacterial host to essentially take over, right? Now the CRISPR system is, you may have heard, is an immune system. So it's a very primitive form of our immune systems, but found in bacteria. And it allows this bacterial host to defend itself against this kind of invasion. So the way that it works is essentially by being able to take fingerprints. Just like, you know, in your favorite cop show, CSI Miami, a cop might take some fingerprints and store them inside a fingerprint database and use this to match a criminal in later crimes. Similarly, the CRISPR system summons a complex host of proteins, small RNAs, and so on to allow you to store fingerprints of the phage genome into the CRISPR locus that's found inside the bacterial genome, okay? And it allows that fingerprint to be used for later matching and then search and destroy. Let's take a little closer look at how that happens. So here's really a busy slide, but stay with me. The beginning and the end is always the same. You have a phage, it's injecting its foreign evil DNA into my bacterial cell, shown here in this gray bounding box, and it routes through three major, very complicated pathways, but it ends up in the degradation of that phage DNA. Okay, so very broadly, what happens is there's a CRISPR locus, it's integrated inside of the bacterial genome, it's part of it, right? And it has a series of proteins and some RNAs that allows you to actually take these short fingerprints shown in red and plop them into the CRISPR locus. This is the fingerprint database, okay? And then it can take these fingerprints and take them, they're currently in the DNA form, and turn them into RNA. And then the RNA can get loaded into these proteins, these Cas genes that encode for Cas proteins, shown in these complexes here. And so you can then match the and shown here in blue, this foreign phage DNA, and then break it down. So let's take a closer look again at how that happens. We're zooming in more and more and more. This is a bit of the history of the field. We'll take some stretch of DNA. Let's say it's a phage DNA, right? However, let's also use our ability to synthesize DNA molecules biochemically to change this from a sequence in the phage genome to a sequence in your own cells. So this is actually something that we kind of joke about a lot in the lab, that we're actually making things that will infect your own, your own DNA or infect your own cells. But if it's, it's some stretch of DNA that recognizes uh, the human genome, you, the Cas9 protein, which is sort of the main player inside these CRISPR systems, will open the DNA up and match this short fingerprint, this what we call a guide RNA or sgRNA for uh, base complementarity. So there are 20 bases of recognition and in a human 3 billion base per genome, about 15 bases will be unique. Okay, so you need 20 bases to pretty much recognize any site in the genome, and you can do that by easily swapping out this 120 base pair sequence, right? I can order, and you can order, a 20 base pair sequence online, right now on your phones for about $5. So you can see the relative difference between difficult and laborious protein engineering and simply this $5 swap, right? And what happens then is this Cas9 scissors will take two domains, rough C and H and H, and break the DNA, shown here. And again, that will lead to the error-prone, non-homologous end joining, or the precise homology-directed repair that I've just told you about. So this allows us to do gene knockout, or more precise types of modifications with a CRISPR system, okay? So now you know a little bit about the tool at a high level. How can we use it, for example, in the development of new therapies? 
So simultaneous advances in DNA sequencing technologies have really allowed us to illuminate the genes that might be involved in disease states. We can use complicated machines like the Illumina HiSeq to take people who are healthy and people that have mutations and sequence them to figure out what mutations are associated with that disease state. So we can find candidate disease genes. Not too complicated, right? If we lay out the genome like this, most of these people look healthy. You sequence people with diseases. We find a kaleidoscope of different genomes scattered uh, throughout the, uh, these, this population. So which of these actually lead to the disease and which ones are actually just correlative and don't really matter, right? So using CRISPR, we can take these candidate disease genes and start to make disease models that allow us to investigate the causal role of these uh, genetic mutations in leading to some disease. For example, in cell models, for example, we take the neuron. If there's a mutation found in an ion channel when we sequence people with autism, we can recreate those mutations in brain cells in a dish and look at whether or not they fire differently, uh, whether or not that's something that's also found in actual patients and start to model this at a low level. But oftentimes for something complicated like a neuropsychiatric disorder, you would want to model something that's actually cognitive, right? Because that's something that we actually see in patients and you can start to take more complicated types of animal models to look at these kinds of mutations at the behavioral level. What's their effect? You can do this in rodents. People can also do this in monkeys. And once you've been able to test this genetic causality with this uh, disease modeling, you could even correct the mutations in a patient for so-called gene therapy. So what is gene therapy and what is it good for? How does it actually work, right? So we, we, we know a little bit about the CRISPR system. We can inject it systemically into the body, in vivo, directly in the body, or in a more targeted way to target a specific organ. For example, hemophilia is an uncontrollable bleeding disorder, which is caused by the mutations in the hepatocytes of your liver so that you're not producing enough blood clotting factor. The liver is actually the home and the factory for most of the circulating proteins in your blood. Now, you can go directly into the cells of the liver, imagine correcting that mutation in factor nine, blood clotting factor, your body's now able to produce it properly, you've cured potentially the hemophilia. And so that's sort of the vision of gene therapy where permanent genetic modifications to your own cells might lead to a more permanent change. Instead of taking an antibody or small molecule, you have to take every month. Hopefully the, the, the sort of broad vision is that this could be one and done, right? And this, however, is actually really quite hard doing this in a safe way, in an effective way, and in a targeted way. How do you target the liver, not my lungs, and not my brain, or my pancreas, or my kidney? That's actually quite difficult. So you can actually solve a lot of these delivery challenges by actually targeting your cells ex vivo. And so in the previous talk, Ruben told you about cancer immunotherapy. This is actually where CRISPR is probably going to make its first mark on human health is in the ex vivo therapies in immune cells where you can take immune cells found in your blood out of the body, put them in a dish, modify them and correct the mutations or delete receptors that, are, that may mediate tumor silencing of the immune system, supercharge them in this dish and put them back autologously into the patient, right? And this is really driving the development of gene surgeries ex vivo where you might be able to target or supercharge the immune system to target cancers more effectively. Um, what I've told you so far, of course, is what we call somatic gene modification. You're taking a person, tissues, cells that already exist and making those changes, right? These would not be heritable changes because they don't happen in the germline. They're not happening in the, you know, your oocytes, they're not happening in your sperm. They wouldn't be passed on to later generations. So you can imagine the controversy around germline editing where you can do in vitro fertilization routinely in the clinic. DNA is a biochemical process. DNA repair is a biochemical process. Could we also modify you know, human embryos as well? And it turns out, although the challenges here are myriad and technical, end of the day, there's nothing biologically different from making a mouse model or a monkey model from making a modified human uh, uh, organ. But the question re really then is, where do we draw the line, right? Where do you draw the line between disease phenotypes or other traits or other phenotypes, right? We're over time starting to expand our ideas of what do we consider disease. Uh, you know, eight hours north of here in, in the Bay Area, a lot of people no longer think disease or aging. Aging might be a disease. Could we try to treat 
aging, try to improve longevity, improve health span. And so, so a lot of people talk about this slippery slope of where do you draw these, those bright lines between therapy and, and other types of modification. Another thing that you can do is start to model, as I alluded to before, cognitive disorders. For example, you can take monkeys instead of rodents that much more closely match you know, human brain processes and start to understand neurodevelopmental disorders or degenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And finally, another thing that people have talked a lot about is this concept of a gene drive, where you can break the barriers of Mendelian inheritance and very rapidly and efficiently propagate a mutation throughout a population. We, I'm really running out of time. But I have a lot more slides, but I'll give you the sort of really brief overview. Okay, the gene drive is, again, you have two copies of every gene, right? We've already talked about this. If you break, if you have a nuclease gene drive that contains your molecular scissors, it will encode molecular scissors that will go to the sister copy and cut it. Now, I already told you about homology-directed repair, where when you break one copy of a gene, it'll look to the sister copy for repair. But what if the sister copy was already changed, right? It would actually lead to a repair that would lead to this copy, and then actually, instead of a heterozygous mutation, you now have a homozygous mutation. And this allows a gene modification to spread itself and actually expand so that, basically, if you have a parent or an F1, with one copy of that modified gene, it'll rapidly spread to the progeny. So again, unaffected, affected, affected. And then it'll just really rapidly, in the course of just a few generations, potentially be able to rapidly spread genes that may be involved in infertility or things like that to try to shut down malaria vectors and so on. But obviously the question is, what are the consequences? Can this be reversible? How do we intervene if something goes wrong? And so. You know, this is really leading to really, you know, healthy and I think international debate about regulating and thinking carefully about what we're doing, uh, you know, in the lab. Uh, finally, I just have one last uh, thing I want to talk about. Again, you can break the DNA to lead to repair. That's what we call gene editing, right? But this is really only scratching the surface of what we can do with these tools. Okay, it's really the beginning. It's only been three years. And what we can do is, in fact, neuter this molecular scissors so that it's just a DNA binding domain. It's essentially able to bind and bring in ectopic function to some locus of interest. So basically, you have Cas9, but now it's a catalytically dead. So it just binds to the DNA. It doesn't break it. If you fuse it to some effector domain, that you can bring this function to a specific sequence of interest in the cell. Why do we care? Why does that matter? One of the things that we can do is to fuse the two fluorescent proteins to visualize the inner life of the cell. But we can not just look, but we can also touch. You can start to fuse transcriptional modifier domains to start to change how certain genes are read out. You can turn them off. And this will allow us to actually manipulate how a cell can respond to its environment. Okay. Um, you might also be able to create more stable epigenetic changes for Lamarckian inheritance where you can make uh, certain types of histone or DNA methylation modifications that could be t uh, potentially stably inherited um, instead of being inherited at the DNA level. And so really the exciting thing here is really this vision of being able to endow our body with intelligent function, right? Imagine in some future where you may be able to repress anti-inflammatory activity, uh, specifically during an infectious state or, you know, whatever your imagination and engineering prowess will allow you to do. Um, I think with that, I'll close. Thank you very much for your time and happy to questions. I have too many slides, but you can reach me at my email here anytime. Uh, happy to, if you ever want to visit the lab, take you around. And i just like to acknowledge our support and you know the real stars of the show you know these are the people who do the work every day well wow <laughs> that's it, you're awesome thank you so i'm blown away um, do we have questions for Patrick? yes I, I've been following this since <clears throat> it, it came out in the news a few years ago. It was such interest, but I don't think about it all the time, and I know you do. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm really curious when you do talk I? about the limit of your imagination and engineering prowess. What, what are you most excited about right now about 
what would you like to see done with this technology? Like, what really keeps you up at night thinking about it? Well, I'll show you a quick slide. And it looks very complicated. Let's actually go a little simpler. And that's to try to understand the genetics of complex genetic disorder, right? And I'm interested, actually, in diseases of aging. And that's, in many ways, why I came here to the SALT. The historical strengths of the Institute really are in cancer and neuroscience, right? And I have a family history of Alzheimer's, basically. And I'm interested in understanding the genetic underpinnings of neurodegeneration. And we have had, over you know, the last 50 years, essentially repeated failure in the understanding of what causes AD. People talk about you know, beta amyloid, about tau tangles. Very little of this seems to have been interventional in the clinic. We've been able to cure or model this in rodents. But there seems to be this species gap between what happens in a mouse and what happens in the human brain. Right? And when we do this kind of you know, sequencing of normal and people and people with Alzheimer's, we find all kinds of genes that are involved. There's this really long tail of gene significance and how, and sort of the idea is if you can have cancer due to the multiple hits of genetic mutations, the hypothesis is likely complex neurodegenerative disease is also caused by the collaboration of multiple genetic mutations. Only now with the tools for doing the reading with DNA sequencing and now technologies for writing DNA in cells with CRISPR are we going to be able to, in a really kind of scalable and high throughput way, screen combinations of genetic mutations and see how they can lead to disease phenotypes? So what we're modeling in the lab every day are really models of cancer resistance, but also Alzheimer's, to try to get at, get at these questions. Yeah. Carol, did you want to? Sure. Hi, Patrick. Hi. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, so I'm going to ask you a loaded question because you know I always ask the hard questions. <laughs> and, of course, it's a very political season. So right now in our country, uh, genetic engineering is, in, for crops at least, is regulated by three different federal departments, USDA, EPA, and uh, Department of Ag. Uh, recently, a CRISPR-Cas9 mushroom, non-browning mushroom, was uh, approved through USDA. That's right. For release. Um, so my question kind of gets to the heart of... Uh, you know, we live in Southern California. There's a lot of movement toward biotechnology, but also against biotechnology. A lot of people who believe in organics and uh, non-GMO products, right? And GMO labeling. So the, I guess my question for you is, what do you think is your responsibility as a scientist using this technique? To not only educate the public, but also to participate in the regulatory process at the highest levels. Yeah, no, thank you. It's, pro think. it's not, um, not process-based. It should be product-based. Right now it's process-based, and CRISPR falls outside of the current regulatory process. Right. Yeah, no, I think, thanks for asking that great question. I think the first thing I'll say is to emphasize the, your last sentence. It's CRISPR falls outside of current regulatory process, right? And why is that? Let's, let's sort of break that down, right? So what is, what is GMO and what does it mean to be a genetically modified organism? Ontologically, that phrase means some artificial manipulation of the genome. Regulatorily, what that really has meant, historically in the GMO field, is the introduction of foreign DNA into plants, right? Typically, those are uh, uh, sequences found in, not dogenously in bacteria, that allow you to confer things like pesticide resistance uh, traits to that, to that plant. Now, uh, part of this is a PR thing, part of this is an education thing, but end of the day, DNA is a biochemical thing, right? Whether or not the sequence originated in bacteria or in a human cell or, you know, in something else, it's not so much what matters. What really matters is what function that particular string of nucleotides encodes for, right? Now, CRISPR, if you're simply doing knockouts, and that's how people made these non-browning mushrooms, is simply modification of existing DNA inside of the plant, right? You're not introducing anything foreign. You're not plopping in bacterial sequences. You're simply turning a trait off that was on before, okay? Now, that is an acceleration of what plant geneticists have been doing for hundreds of years, right? It's no different from what you do in your garden when you 
for example, may take well, the large strawberry plants and you know, germinate them together, whatever. I, I, I'm, I'm not a plant biologist. <laughs> but I think there is going to be regulatory revisitation of what it means to be GMO in the light of being able to do these kinds of changes with CRISPR that don't involve the introduction of foreign DNA. It's very different from what you know, people imagined before simply because we couldn't really do this very well you know, previously. So that's sort of the one clarification I like to make about GMO. The other thing about the regulatory process and sort of the responsibility of scientists for what we create in the lab. I think we are extremely aware of it. This is something that we work with every day. My students create concentrated lentivirus which is a modified form of HIV to create and package gene editing reagents that infect human cells with high efficiency, right? This is something that we do in the disease tissue culture hoods. We work with gloves, with bleach, with all the appropriate you know, safety uh, sort of precautions that are IRB approved, but end of the day, you know, these are the realities of what we work with, with with our own hands, right? And so I think that this really just goes to say, we really get it. <laughs> and uh, broadly within the science community, there have been very open and very robust discussions about this, both nationally and internationally. Uh, late last year, last December, the National Academy of Sciences convened a gene editing summit to talk about these ethical and regulatory issues. Um, a lot of us give interviews, write blog posts, are you know, in the media to talk about this. I think there's yeah, there's, uh, as this gets more practical and closer to the clinic, I think people just should educate themselves. I think it's great that you guys are all here today to learn more about this. Please go back and read more about it. Ask me questions if you have them. I'm happy to always answer them. But, you know, it's, people, people have said, you know, it's like the beginnings of, uh, you know, molecular biology with PCR, right? This is a fundamentally enabling tool that allows us to answer old questions. You know, we've had these for a long time, but only now are we able to really, you know, get at them. So there's a lot of science to do, a lot of, you know, potential scientific implications to talk about, but, you know, it's, it's happening now, today. I think we're going to have one more question over here. Just so you guys know, we are going to be, you know, I know where he works. So, <laughs> uh, same thing with Ron and Ruben. Um, one of the things that we hope to do in the workshops is to give you guys a chance to brainstorm questions, not only to, you know, to help you bring this to your students, but also all these things that right now, you know, half an hour from now, you're going to go, oh, I should have asked this. We'll compile those, and I'll be sending them to these guys, and they will answer them. Cool. <laughs> They'll be very good about that. But for now, let's